So I came to this provocation through my dissertation. And as I started to learn about feminist disability theory and more about intersectionality, I was recognizing sort of in the discourse um, and the agenda pursued by the independent living movement as a, a strand of a disability rights movement, um, this, this ethic or this communication of a set of values that was really an embrace of independence, um, but a rejection of dependence and an embrace of support, but also a rejection of care. Um, and I guess an, an analysis of this discourse, thinking through these, these themes of identity politics um, and intersectionality can really help to elucidate the influence of class, of um, type of disability, of gender and of race on the movements, um, the, the independent living movements pursuit of equality, which we might understand as inclusion into a normative lifestyle. Um, and again, just before I move on, I'll, I'll note that I, I intentionally included an image on this slide here of what, what appears to be or what I read to be um, a white male wheelchair user, apparently at a protest, I think maybe in the 70s, with a sign that says, we shall overcome. So with the this introduction of intersectionality really popularized into a, a common lexicon. I think it's really important to acknowledge the roots of this concept being in black feminist thought um, and particularly first introduced in the work of the Combahee River Collective, um, who described the unique lived experiences of black women who were um, being marginalized in both black male led civil rights movements and white women led feminist movements. So the, the statement that the Combahee River Collective published in 1977 introduced the concept of identity politics as a politics rooted in lived experiences of oppression, but also asserted the value of the, the very unique epistemological orientation of living as a black woman, highlighting the, the distinct knowing the, and, and the very particular politics that stem from a specific subject position um, in this case, affected by both sexism and racism, um, and which oriented this group not towards a politics of equality, but towards a politics of collective liberation. So I wanna come back to this question about lived experience and disability activism and scholarship where a certain primacy has been given to lived experience. Um, and I think obviously for good reason, given um, the historical context um, in a historical context in which presumably non-disabled people have spoken over, spoken for, done research on and about disabled people um, and research that has um, supported moves at worst to eradicate disability or to end disabled lives. So this proverbial us in nothing about us without us is, is very clearly, I think, center, um, meant to center the lived experiences um, of lived experiences of disablement or of disability. And as such, it's, I think we could describe it as an epistemological claim to um, the knowing that is only possible to apprehend through lived experience, um, in this case, lived experience of disability. Um, I've included a citation on the slide here to Gigi and Veronica, who's done some, uh, wrote, wrote a fascinating paper on this idea of strategic essentialism. Um, and so essentialism implying that there is a static and cohesive group that's represented when we say us, and that then there is um, conversely a static and cohesive group who is them or not us. Um, and so I, I've sort of played with this idea of strate strategic essentialism, wondering if, um, if there's something, something of that committed in this, um, this assertion of an us that we, that we very readily um, return to. And in, in their writing about strategic essentialism, Veronica talks about how um, there's a tendency to center particular kinds of lived experience. And, and most often those that really cohere with normative expectations. So those inspirational or overcoming narratives, um, ones that are, are sort of more palatable to a mainstream. Um, and then that the consequence of this is an erasure 
or a marginalization of a broader range of experiences and interests within a disabled identity category. And so I'm really interested um, for, for various reasons in troubling a binary understanding of disability identity um, in order to hopefully create space for a range of disability adjacent identities, um, which might include folks with conditions that haven't conventionally been labeled as disabilities, such as chronic illnesses or mental illness or, or what people might claim as madness. Folks who are hesitant to claim disability labels due to consequences associated with disclosure or to uh, historical and, and ongoing pathologization practices around gender, sexuality, and race. Also, folks who struggle to access diagnoses. So, um, for instance, people who might have inequitable access to gatekeeping physicians. And and this is coming uh, more directly from my own research, we might also include in this category people who, who experience ableism broadly. Um, and I say to Lila Lewis here, who points out that one does not have to be disabled in order to experience ableism. Um, we might also include here people who live with disability, and that's a, a term um, from Alison Kafer, that a term that describes how people know disability, can come to know disability very well by living um, within disability cultural spaces. Um, or another another sort of descriptor here that I really enjoy is Akimi Nishida's use of effective relationalities that describes um, through care work relationships, how people come to know each other's realities intimately. Um, and just a, Um, a thought to close on, and I want to credit Jeff, who we'll hear from next, uh, with introducing me to this idea that is nothing without us. So nothing about us with a strike through the about us, and simply nothing without us. Um, I think this can be a really helpful way that we begin to shift thinking towards a more inclusive and liberatory politics that centers um, disabled epistemologies, or what um, some folks would call crip wisdom. Um, and really attending to ways that that is relevant and important and instructive, not just for disabled lives, but for society at large or for uh, shifting and changing the ways that we understand normative ways of doing and being. Um, I, and I, I guess um, part of what I would like to suggest or end on is um, that we can, we can do this in a way that moves beyond what might be a divisive or a binary identity politics um, by thinking through um, or I guess thinking beyond what people look like um, and, and thinking instead out towards the, the oppressions that people experience um, so that we can talk less about who people are always shifting and changing identities um, and more about what we experience. Um, so that we can sort of refine, redefine that us through um, a solidarity, through a, a shared experiential understanding of marginalization or, or oppression. Um, and this is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thinking I've really come to through working with disability studies students who I think come into disability studies in a, in a space of wanting to help. Um, but wanting to help someone else, but not really wanting to look inwards and think about why are we here? Why do we want to help? What are our motivations and motives for being here? Um, and so the, the last thing I wanted to share is just a, a quote from the Combahee River Collective who write, we believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics come directly out of our own identity as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. Um, so that's, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to hear, I, as I mentioned, I, I have a bit of discomfort with um, sharing some of the critique of, a, of, of a, such a, I think, closely held phrase, nothing about us without us, but um, very um, open to any thoughts or feedback. I'm going to jump in and just say, I absolutely love this, Erica. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. We're looking for any quick hands. Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna rotate the stage to Jeff so that I think everyone is still very eager to hear, and then 
we can hang out over lunch and continue the conversation. Jeff, thank you so much for being with us. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna hijack your screens here. Hopefully this will work. And you should be able to see the slides now. See, it's a nods, perfect, thank you. Uh, so cognizant of time, uh, I'm, I'm gonna try and keep my, my comments brief. Uh, and by that, I will probably talk for an hour. Um, what I wanna talk a little bit about today and what I was thinking about as we were coming into this uh, is, is this, this question of, of emancipation, this question of uh, changing the channel on the ways in which we think about or talk about disability. Uh, and I thought it was really important uh, to end on a, on a low note, um, on a note of, uh, of devastation, uh, perhaps, but there is no way out. And so uh, given that it is uh, April 1st, a day which we refer to as uh, April Fool's Day, I thought that it would be probably nice for us to talk a little bit about intellectual disability and specifically about the cultural construction of it and the ways in which we are not in a place that is just so simple as we just produce a new image or produce a new way of thinking, uh, a new um, story to tell about disability because so often, even when we intend the best, uh, the story does not necessarily change. Uh, so, uh, so who am I? Uh, so I'm, I'm Jeff Preston. I, like uh, Dr. Katzman, I'm a professor of disability studies at King's University College. Um, I work in the world of disability and media, disability and culture. Uh, not everyone has the same opinion of me. Uh, not everyone likes me. Uh, people on the internet, for instance, uh, particularly those who uh, like to eat horse medication. Uh, think that I'm not a real doctor, and that's fine. Uh, I will let you decide the uh, validity of my claims as we uh, go through today. So one of the one of the things I've been doing and working on over the last couple of years uh, is trying to find a new way to think a little bit about the internet and specifically to think about internet content uh, and these wild things that we call internet memes. Uh, and we talk a lot about internet memes in terms of virality. We talk about them in lots of terms like the ways that we think about marketing, about well, why does a meme work? Why is it successful? How does it spread? What will the next meme be? And sometimes it's actually really easy to know what the next meme is. I mean, I think all of us knew on Sunday night at a certain point in time, we all knew what the internet memes were gonna look like on Monday morning. Pretty obvious what it would look like. Uh, but I'm interested in something else. And I'm interested in the ways in which, in fact, the ways that we understand the internet meme is perhaps better seen through the lens of postmodernist thinkers, specifically uh, Baudrillard and our old friend Deleuze, and this concept of simulacra, uh, rather this idea of copies of copies of copies that no longer have a, a root referent. Uh, where the reality that sits behind these images is no longer able to be seen. And as Baudrillard then warns us, the image becomes a replacement for a reality. And reality is then required to catch up to the image as opposed to the other way around. In this way, I think then that when we look at internet memes, what we're seeing is rather a hyper-reality as opposed to a reality. So many of us will talk about, you know, in reference to Sunday night and the slap heard around the world, we will think that we know about the reality of that situation. What we really only know is the image of it, the replication of it, the spread of it, the repeating and folding in of a story, which actually doesn't capture anything that we would call reality, because as people like Baudrillard would argue, reality no longer applies. But I want to think a little bit about this in particular in relation to an internet meme, uh, which I will refer to as the potato meme, um, and the ways in which best laid plans can sometimes be laid to rest. So there are three really important seeds of the internet meme, uh, which I call the potato meme. Uh, and these things are not all on the internet and are not actually tethered to the intended or current use of the meme itself. Uh, the potato meme is rooted out of a world in which we see intellectual limitation as being a fundamentally bad thing. And the ways in which we use the R word as a catatrist as a means of showing things as being devalued or being dumb or being bad. 
Um, so of course, um, we have all heard the ways that people use the R word uh, to dismiss people or to dismiss ideas, to mark it as bad. This idea of intellectual disability as being a bad thing or being irrelevant, invalid, has been passed on from a very long history that leads out of, in many ways, out of racial science, racial pseudoscience at the turn of the century, parts of the eugenics movement, and carries us all the way forward to 2005 when we have this film uh, called The Ringer, uh, which is where we find the source of the phrase, I can count to potato. Now this line is being used in a scene, which you'll see in the top right corner in the film, uh, in a character who's trying to perform intellectual disability so that he is able to rig the Special Olympics and win it. That's the setup of the film. So he is trying to put on the image of intellectual disability. And to do so, he uses this non sequitur, I can count to potato, as symbolic of his dysfunctional brain. Now, this is, of course, this scene is about a critique about the ways in which we think about intellectual disability, but the phrase itself was harvested, pulled out, and then applied to the image on the screen in the bottom left uh, of Heidi Montag walking on the beach. Uh, the phrase is added, I can count the potato, implying that Heidi Montag, like our old friend um, Johnny Knoxville in the slide above, is in fact a person with an intellectual disability, therefore is open to ridicule, is not serious, is invalid. The final C that we need to think a little bit about is the film Tropic Thunder. And this is really where I want to sort of zoom in here for just a brief moment. But as in the movie Tropic Thunder, we have this phrase, never go full retard. It's a scene in which um, our character, played by Robert Downey Jr. in blackface, which is a whole other conversation, uh, it's a scene that is talking about the ways in which Hollywood prioritizes and privileges men that play disabled characters with intellectual disabilities and give them awards for it, uh, or really any disability in many ways. The use of the R word, however, in the film sparked a protest led by the Special Olympics. And the Special Olympics started to organize in the United States to start a campaign called Spread the Word to Stop the Word, uh, which it turns out was a very very successful campaign. The campaign was, let's make the R word a bad word to say, a word that we are going to agree is offensive and should not be used. My argument is that their campaign was so effective that people stopped using the word as often. However, what we see is a shift. So rather than calling people the R word, we now start to refer to them online as potatoes. And these two things happen almost simultaneously, that as the start the word to spread the word campaign starts, we get our first example of the I can count the potato pinwheel image. When we look at the mimetic cluster then, and we see how it shapes out, we have two real lines that we use. We talk about it, uh, potatoes being those with predominantly Down syndrome or facial deformity. Or we use the word potato to talk about celebrities or politicians as ways to show them as being invalid. So for instance, we have Donald Trump who can count potato uh, or Rick Scott or uh, Rob Ford uh, who cannot count potato, but allegedly can count to crack instead. So potato basically becomes this replacement term for the R word. But what happens when reality seeps into the equation? Well, it turns out that actually this young woman here on our screen is a woman named Heidi Crowder. And Heidi is a woman with Down syndrome whose image you will see in the top left in that original pinwheel meme that comes out shortly after uh, the beginning of this uh, spread the word to end the word campaign. And Heidi, as a teenager now, decides to try to reclaim their image. And they say, there are all these memes making fun of people with intellectual disability, and they're using my face, an image of her that had been stolen from a Facebook group. Now, Heidi's life has essentially lived in complete opposition of the potato meme. She is not dysfunctional. She is not invalid. She is intelligent. She has great ideas. She has been fighting for the rights of disabled people and people with Down syndrome in Britain as a teenager and now into her 20s. Despite this fact, though, despite this assertion of reality, what we see is a doubling down of the potato meme. 
What we see is a new flurry of meta generation, new images that use either a new image of Heidi Kroeder, uh, images of her mother, and the reassertion that people who are potatoes are not to be taken seriously, that they are stupid, that they cannot do anything themselves. And we have a new layer added in of uh, critique of feminism and quote, social justice warriors, largely generated out of the work of people on 4chan. What all of this is trying to bring together and what I'm trying to think a little bit through is the ways in which very good intentions or even meaningful critiques made about the ways in which we talk about represent disability are necessarily perhaps doomed to fail because the conversation itself is not necessarily rooted in any sort of reality. But rather what we're trying to do is fight through years and years of repetition of images that are not rooted in reality, but rather are rooted on representation, imagination, and the cultural construction of disability. What this leads me to, to believe then is that when we think about the ways in which we market disability, when we market accessibility, the ways that we produce new images of disability, we are not in control of the image, but rather instead of thinking about changing the image itself, we need to be thinking more about the ways that we start to dig down into this deeper cultural understanding of disability that is not enough to change the word, but rather we need to fundamentally tackle the long-standing cultural production of disability in both popular culture, but now also in digital culture. So I'm going to leave things sort of at there, um, and that is like a light speed run uh, through a whole bunch of things. Um, but I'm, I'm probably out of time at this point by far. So uh, I am going to wrap there. Uh, this is fantastic. I will turn it over to Annika. But uh, how fascinating and important and, and also fascinating. I think this barrier uh, between fantasy and reality is so under research. It's culturally important for representation, but it is also a, a set of resources, a repertoire of resources that would bear witness to how people activate to just cope with the insufficiency and the inadequacy of our current reality. So we are, we are learning from you and we're thinking alongside with you. And I think that's really, really, really important that gap that you know that the idea that sometimes the fantasy can push the reality um, beyond its status quo and beyond its limitation. I think it's something that um, it's just beginning to mobilize and just beginning to show us how short we're coming to what we deserve and what we're entitled to. So. Yeah, um, absolutely. Both um, Erica and Jeff, I thought both of your presentations were really uh, interesting, insightful, um, both you know, embodied wisdom, something um, we're grappling with in, in some of our research ourselves. And, and I really, um, Jeff, like this um, multiple layers of your insight, but especially this how one thing then replaces the other and how it culturally impacts us but of course as it should also individually really impact certain certain people but just how just saying don't say one word isn't isn't creating what the disability movement needs it needs to go much much further than that and making people understand um the huma humanity that is within the community sorry that sounded weird but anyway um <laughs> does anybody else want to um give a brief comment before um, we all break or well-deserved lunch or late morning snack or something i do want to ask yeah? uh oh, quickly, okay. I, I think erica especially but maybe also jeff but Erica's uh, presentation especially made me think of uh, like where have you looked and where have you found or have you found any literature that kind of speaks to this this idea directly that you know the choice is not 
binary and, and that there it's it's more like uh, could we think about it as, as a scale or whatever it is uh, that, that you brought up is there a stream of literature that you found particularly helpful in that and I'm asking for very selfish reasons because I really like what you talked about and it relates a lot to to um, arguments that um, relate to my research as well so help me <laughs> Yeah, I um, perhaps we can be in touch because I, I haven't, uh, I wouldn't say that there is a lot of literature. I'm actively looking for it and I'm looking for it outside of disability studies because that's not where I have been able to find it. Um, within, so disability justice movement um, and, and particularly the, the performance group Sins Invalid has um, a statement of 10 principles of disability justice that really are, I think, really grounded in uh, explicitly um, in intersectionality in this disabled embodied wisdom knowing. Um, and they also draw on principles of um, cross movement and cross disability um, solidarity. And so it's, it's a bit on the fringe of an academic literature. Uh, there are, I think there are some people starting to write in disability studies who are drawing um, that analysis in because it seems to be uh, just very, it's, it's speaking, it's speaking to people. Um, but I think the closest I have, I have found is in actually reading black feminist literature. Um, there's a, a, a book, uh, um, uh, Kianga Taylor, um, writes uh, about the um, the Combahee River Collective and their statement and interviews the activists who were part of the collective that came up with the statement and they really speak to that um, that uh, it, it sort of follows the logic of um, you know no one is free until we are all free or you have to sort of work on liberating the most marginalized people in order to um, experience collective liberation. Um, so those are those are the best sources I have. But um, you know, I'm always looking to, to kind of deepen this line of thought. So happy to chat more if you're also interested in that. Yeah, definitely. We'll continue the conversation. Thank you. It was really interesting. Okay. Um... Thank you, thank you to our four presenters, Ariel, Alex, Erica, and Jeff, and thanks for everyone who listened, commented, asked questions. We hope everyone took lots of new ideas, insights, away that they can incorporate, um, build on, start dialogues, chats with each other. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we are going to have a break now for in our time zone for lunch we are going to continue for those of you who want to join us in the afternoon we're going to continue with a panel on how to support disabled entrepreneurs at 1 p.m central time and in 45 minutes in 45, 45 minutes yeah. exactly so um same link so either just stay in here we join us then and there more interesting sessions coming after that panel as well. So um, thank you and hopefully see you later. Otherwise, see you at the next Spring Institute Day, which will be sometime mm -hmm. um, in April, well, May. In May, yes. <laughs> because we're in April, May. Um, but announcements will come soon. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing work. I absolutely love this work. So thank you.